worship this morning. What a beautiful day for us to gather together to worship God and be community together. I want to welcome you today to worship as we gather to learn and grow and be in the theme that nothing can separate us from God's forgiving love today when we live in God's grip of grace. A few announcements this morning. Today we, we begin our learning on the lawn. That will happen shortly after worship. Darcy is here. She is ready to go and is looking forward to spending time with you as well as Nancy and myself. We look forward to meeting up and having some time together for our young people. Wednesday night, you're invited to gather around the campfire, gather at the campfire and then beyond. We begin at five o'clock with the praise handbells. Supper's at 545, just a light supper. Then we gather around a campfire for edgy worship at six. There is confirmation at small groups and King's Ringers at 630 and the Hosanna choirs at 715. All are welcome. There is room for all. Um, if you were unable to join us last week for the family reunion, we handed out uh, Connect, Connect with God's Story in Community and Connect with Hosanna. This is just a little magazine publication that describes the ministries here at Hosanna this fall. Um, and we invite you to pick one up. They're at the table where you receive bulletin and communion elements and the offering. So there's a bunch back there. If you can't find one back there, see me. I have a few up here with me. <coughs> with that, that's the end of my announcements. Anybody else have announcements for the good of the community this morning? Seeing none, let's join together in our call to worship. When we are tired and weary, when we are plumb worn out, we remember we are, we are children, children of God and ambassadors of Christ. When we wonder how long this word pandemic will be part of our daily vocabulary, we remember we are children of God and ambassadors of Christ. When our exhaustion overflows into frustration, impatience, and uncertainty, we remember we are children of God and ambassadors of Christ. Gracious God, you are, you are forever reminding us who we are in you. Show us how to love you and to love our neighbor in this time and place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to join in the singing of our gathering hymn.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We join together in a time of confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Jesus Christ, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Amen. Pray together. Generous God, your Son gave us life that we may come to peace with you. Give us a share of your Spirit, and in all we do, empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The scripture reading is from Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, you have no excuse, whoever you are, 
when you judge others. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, are doing the very same thing. You say, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things in accordance with the truth. Do you imagine, whoever you are, that when you judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do you not realize that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But by your hard and impotent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's judgment, righteous judgment will be revealed. For he will repay according to each one's deeds. To those who by patiently doing good seek for glory and honor in immortality, he will give eternal life. While for those who are self-seeking and who obey not the truth but wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be anguish and distress for everyone who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to remain seated as we welcome the gospel this morning. son. Let's see if you remember it. I invite the children to come. If children are here today and they'd like to come forward and say the pictures, they're welcome to come up close and stand in front here. Otherwise, you may re remain in your seats as we hear the story. Jesus spent time with all sorts of people, even people who had done bad things. This made some people mad. Why is Jesus always around people who do bad things, they grumbled. Jesus heard them, so he told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son, who was a bit wild and crazy, came to his father and said, Dad, I want to get away from here. I want my money. This made the father sad, but he split his money and gave his son the part that was his. The younger son packed his bag and headed away from home. The son traveled to a faraway country and spent all his money on fancy parties and food. Soon he had no more money and no place to stay. Lucky for him, he found a man who let him sleep in his barn if the son would feed the pigs. What am I thinking, he said to himself as he fed the pigs. The men who work for my father have more than enough to eat, and here I am starving to death. I'll go home and say to my father, Dad, I made a big mistake. I'm not good enough to be your son, but would you let me work for you? And so he went home. 
While he was still far away from home, his father saw him. His father ran and threw his arms around him. The father put a ring on his son's finger and shoes on his feet and ordered a party be thrown for him. The older son saw his father's servants preparing for a party and asked, what's going on? Your brother is home, said a servant, and your father is having a party. This made the older son angry at the father. I've always done right, what's right, he said to his father. I've worked hard for you, but you've never given me a party. Now my brother came home after he wasted your money. Why are you throwing him a party? The father answered, My son, you have always been with me, but your brother left and has now come back. Then the people understood. Jesus spent time with those people because even though they had done bad things, they decided to change their lives and live like God wanted. This made Jesus so happy. Thank you for coming up, girls. Now, the focus of this story, the point that's most generally remembered when this gets taught and summarized is that of that ungrateful son. The son who thinks he can do better on his own. He asks for his dad's inheritance, and some theologians push this a little more bluntly, saying, he told his father, I wish you were dead. Or, you're dead to me. Give me what I am owed. He walks out of his father's life with what he thinks he is owed to a life he thinks he deserves. He lives, and he lives his life to the fullest until over time, the inheritance is gone, and he discovers the life he now has. He ends up being fed less than what he feeds the pigs. The Bible story tells us he came to his senses and he goes to his father and said, Father, I have sinned against you and God, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Hoping he could come back and be treated at least as good as his father's servants. As he nervously walked home and he was getting closer and his heart began to race, his father came to him, saw him coming, wrapped his arms around him in a great embrace, and threw a lavish party for his son, who was lost and now found. And then the focus goes on the great forgiving love of the father. The love of great forgiving love of God that welcomes those who have gone astray and welcomes us too when we have gone astray and wanted to go it alone. Now sometimes the very astute, especially the very astute confirmation student, will pick up on the older brother. Usually it's more of an afterthought. But today I want to prepare you to hear the reading of the gospel from the book of Luke, chapter 15. Let's set the stage a bit. Jesus is teaching and he's tell, teaching his disciples and he's telling these stories, not to just his disciples, but he's telling these stories in response to the Pharisees and the scribes, in response to the Jewish leaders who are questioning who Jesus is. They're questioning who Jesus thinks he is and they're questioning who Jesus is hanging out with, who Jesus is eating with, who Jesus is in relationship with. Chapter 15 begins this way. Tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and the legal experts were grumbling, saying, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus responds to the Pharisees and the scribes with three stories. The stories of the lost sheep, the stories of the lost coin, and the story of the lost son. We focus today on the lost son. But as you listen to the gospel, I invite you to listen with the ears and the hearts 
questioning, what do the Pharisees and the, and the scribes hear? Those who have the rule and the responsibility in society of making judgments of right and wrong, who is in, who is out. And remember, they're getting annoyed with Jesus. They're getting annoyed with Jesus eating with the tax collectors, with the sinners, you know, those that have turned away from societal norms of what is fair and right. Honestly, Jesus is intentionally eating with those that have been intentionally hurt or taken advantage of others. They've engaged in irresponsible behaviors of independence and I don't need God. They can do better on their own. You know, the Pharisees and tax collectors would tell, Pharisees and scribes would tell you, they're unlovable, undeserving, and unworthy. Now listen to the gospel through this lens. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me a share of my inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them. Soon after, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth on extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in the country, and he began to be in need. He hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of the father's hired hands have more than enough food? But I'm starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to the father. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. And then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out your best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because the son of mine was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and now it's found. And they began to celebrate. Now here's where I think the Pharisees and the scribes would prefer Jesus had stopped. But Jesus goes on. Now his older son was in the field. Coming in from the field, he approached the house and heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what is going on. The servant replied, Your brother has arrived and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received his son back safe and sound. Then the older son was furious and didn't want to enter in. But his father came out and begged him. He answered his father, Look! I've served you in all these years, and I've never disobeyed your instructions. Yet you've never given me as much as a young goat, so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this young son of yours returns, after gobbling up the estate on prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Then his father said, Son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. What do you suppose stood out to the Pharisees and the religious leaders? What stuck out to them? Did this story make them a little uncomfortable? Was it full of law to convict them? After three stories about the lost being found, Jesus clearly addressed, addresses their self-righteous indignation, their self-righteous judgment, their 
in a more society acceptable way of focusing on their dependence, on their being good, or their being better than the other rather than their dependence on God, on their need for God's grace, and the fact that it, it is their need. That fullness and abundance of grace has been there all along, and they've missed it. Or maybe they haven't fully acknowledged or appreciated it. Or maybe they just thought they deserved it more than the others. And that in itself can severely limit the experience of God's grace and abundance. Beloved people of God, if we think about it, most of us can identify times in our lives that we can identify with all three characters in the story. The younger son making foolish decisions the older son being self-righteous and judgmental. And over the course of our lives, maybe even knowing the heartbreak of the father. Each of these roles contain pain. Each of these roles contain brokenness. They're about separation from who we are created to be. Relationships we are called to be part of with one another and with God. Maybe this is even making you a little, and me, a little uncomfortable this morning. Maybe it makes us want to respond and come back with, yeah, but, and point to somebody else. Notice I pointed in the green grass over there. If so, that uncomfortableness is the law at work. Ready for the good news in this story? I am. The truly good news of the story is God's forgiving love is big enough for all. God's forgiving love is abundant enough to embrace, to hold, to welcome back, to bless, and to love all who have created barriers in their relationship with God. It's big enough for all who have forgotten their need and their dependence on God's grace. This pandemic and other events in our world has brought out the best of people at times. And yes, it's brought out the worst of people. People are divided. Families are divided. Hearts are broken. No one has gone unaffected by the hurt and loss. And for goodness sakes, we all know there's plenty of that to go around. Dear church, beloved church, can we start a movement? Can we start to respond in another way? Can we respond to this pandemic in another way? Can we respond with a return to humility? A return to compassion? A return to acknowledging our own imperfections, our own brokenness, our own failings, and our dependence on God? Can we return to seeing the face of Jesus in every face we meet? And in doing so, live as forgiven people, offering grace, support, love, encouragement, and compassion for our neighbor. Extending that grace over and over and over again offering the opportunity for healing of broken relationships for the sake of the gospel so what does this look like 
it may be reaching out and having hard conversations with someone who has been difficult or you have been struggling with. It may be apologizing for a wrong you have done. Or people of God, it may be as simple or not as looking at how you treat others who too are being impacted by the pandemic in our daily lives. Any of you exp experience long lines and waits when you go to the store or a restaurant or medical facilities? Have you experienced places being low on resources, low on people power, trying to face high demands? How do you respond? This past week, I got to spend some time with my daughter and we went for a quick trip through a coffee shop drive through that didn't end up being quite as quick as we had hoped. We pulled in, there was a car behind us, there was no moving in or out and we were stuck for 45 minutes. Oh. Now, I would like to say your pastor was wonderful and modeled great compassion and grace with her 16-year-old daughter standing next to us, sitting next to her, but uh, um, what can be taking so long? And the people in front of us and behind us who were blocked in were frustrated too. And you could feel the frustration building in the line as there's a honk here or there. And you could hear as people were getting their coffee, people are yelling at the barista who's trying to serve. And we got up to the line, to the window. They took our money and we waited five more minutes on our drink. And this poor barista opens up, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and is apologizing profusely. And you know she is obviously having a bad day. And the temptation to say, I just don't understand why it's taking so long, was in there. I could have stuck in my self-righteous indignation. Who wants to sit in a drive through line for 45 minutes for a cup of coffee? That's not what we expect. I could have let the barista know what I deserved. But as I sat there, I reached back into my billfold and pulled out the change I was given. And my Katie's looking at me going, Mom, what are you going to do? And I, hand, and I handed her my change. And I asked what the bill was for the car behind me. That $10 bill I handed her paid for two cars behind me. That bit of grace makes a difference. I know it made a difference for the barista who took a breath and dared to smile. I'm assuming it made a difference, hopefully, for the two cars behind. But it also made a difference for the two people in my car. Because here's the thing. When we extend grace to others, we are also recipients of that grace. I don't think Katie and I complained about waiting for 45 minutes for coffee that day. Actually, I know we didn't. Katie looked at me and said, thank you, Mama, for doing this. But do you know what I got that day? I got 45 minutes of uninterrupted time with my 16-year-old daughter to be in conversation. 
those of you who've had teenagers, you know what a gift that is. People of God, simple, teeny act made a difference in at least three, I'm hoping at least five lives. Let's return to who we are and who we are called to be. Workers in the kingdom of God. Spreading the gospel, spreading the good news, the forgiving love, the abundant grace to a world that so desperately needs it. Let's extend it to our families. Let's extend it to our neighbors. Let's extend it to those we work with. Let's extend it to our family of faith. And let's expand, ex, extend it to our world. The forgiving love of God embraces each one of us. It is abundant. It is extravagant. It is more than enough. And it's ours to live into to receive it and extend it to the world. People of God, may I hear an amen? Amen. Let's join together in singing our hymn of the day. Children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all for in need. We pray for the church and its ministry. May we be a place of extravagant welcome and grace, a place for second chances and joyful reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for those in authority. Give them wise minds and compassionate hearts. Strengthen in them a desire to protect the vulnerable and care for those underserved. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for those who are struggling with cancer, dementia, or any other disease. Provide them with the peace and resilience for the days ahead. We pray especially for those who are known among us. Dell, Mike, Brent, Joe Youngstrom's father, Jack, Michelle, Larry, Doug, Chuck, Terry Ashworth's brother-in-law, Dan, and Cindy Finnegan's mother, Marlis. Sustain them and their caregivers with energy and patience. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all your saints, those we have loved and known, and those from every time and place. Continue to guide us by their example and reassure us of your promised salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to share a sign of peace with those around you. Peace be with you. We now take time to prepare our hearts and minds to come to the table. Just a little bit of housekeeping for those who may be new with us. You receive communion cups when you came in. There are two seals on this cup. There's a clear seal that will cover your bread. There is a purple seal covering your wine. We found it helpful if we pull the clear seal and make access to the bread now. So when we get to the time of receiving the elements, then we will pull the purple seal when we're ready to drink. We begin with the liturgy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God. Through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, open us to the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels, the church on earth, and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Spirit, we join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. 
in the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks and broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now we receive the elements. This is the body of Christ given for you. I invite you to take your purple seal off. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And now having been fed and nourished by the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, may you go strengthened, equipped, kept, forgiven, and sent in God's amazing grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you and in fervent love towards one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life and grace to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless and keep you now and forever. Amen. Amen. We join in singing our sending hymn.
as you leave, remember, we are children of God and ambassadors of Christ. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you.